my mother said, you need to go to church. You need to go to church. And so one Sunday morning I got up. I said, I don't have the clothes to go to that white church, which was two blocks down the street. And, uh, but I got up and I put on a dress I remember distinctly that I had made. And I got my two little girls ready and I took them down to the white church. And I'd been to church before and the preachers never came and they never invited you back. And uh, I said my children range in colors from vanilla to chocolate. <laughs> and uh, uh, Miles knows, knows Donna, my daughter is a minister, um, and she has brown hair. Um, and I'm gonna pass around, this is my children and me and one, my first granddaughter. And uh, this is the same daughter and she's buried in my first granddaughter. So I went to church. I went to Emmanuel Baptist Church. And I didn't know that I was gonna start a uh, change, a revolution basically in that community because that church was all white. At least it looked all white. Actually, there were a lot of natives there that went for white. They were going for white. And they never one time told me they were native. You know, and that there was a black janitor there. And as I would go to church, uh, I would speak to him and his wife, because they cleaned. And the, they um, had made a pact that if they ever joined the church, because they were from Roxboro, North Carolina, it would be that church. And when I joined that church, they joined that church. Mm -hmm. And then many other people joined that church. And it became a multicultural church in 1965, mm -hmm. right after the sit-ins in Woolworth. My and life revolved around that church. And the pastor and the associate pastor had me as the token Indian on every board <laughs> in the city. <laughs> I was on the legal aid board. I was on the Human Relations Commission. I was on every board. I was the first Indian to be there. And at that time, I didn't even have a high school education. Then I began to work for the Ford Foundation, and uh, I got a little Volkswagen, and sometimes I'd have eight people scrapped. <laughs> uh, how I got them in there, I have no idea. It had to rock when we would be leaving the community college. It had to rock because we would be telling stories and laughing, and, and I, was, I was learning. I was learning. I had gone back to school, and I was getting that GED, and I got that GED, and, and then um, I was teaching in the Baptist church, and, um, and we continued. My husband became a deacon, and uh, he was head of the deacons, and I became a deaconess. And one day, uh, the Pharaoh that I knew left, the Pharaoh that I knew, and there became a new pharaoh who didn't recognize those Indian people. And he got up and he read a proclamation from the governor of North Carolina in 17-something. And he said, thank God that the white people had not been ravaged by the savages. And I stood up in the congregation and I said, thank God that we're still here and that you didn't kill us all. And at that time, I was working. I, I went to uh, Junaluska with the Southeastern Jurisdictional Native American program that only the Southeast has. No other jurisdiction has this program. And I was struck by the magnificence of five tribes singing in their own language. Mm -hmm. Amazing Grace. We always sang Amazing mm -hmm. Grace, sang it in five languages. And it was published in the United Methodist book mm -hmm. in those languages. And I was just amazed and, uh, that the tribal agency in the community wanted me to help them start a church, a United Methodist church. And I said, yeah, I'm going to do that. And I did that. And my husband and my daughter said, we're going to be your first members. And I kept saying, I'm not going nowhere. I ain't going nowhere. This is my church. This is where I belong. But one day, after the first worship service at that church, I heard God say distinctly, 
you will go where I tell you to go. Mm -hmm. I'm the God of the Methodist Church, and I'm the God of the Baptist Church. <laughs>